everyone. I'm Emma Henderson with the Marketing Department here at National College of Ireland and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the college this evening. It's bittersweet really because this is the third and final event in the series and I'd like to thank everyone who's attended so far and everyone who's here tonight um, and who's supported these events. So if you're on Twitter, we're using the hashtag GoFurtherWithNCI and the Wi-Fi details are on all of the tables. So no pressure, but the crowd at the last event were so active that we actually trended in Ireland. So we'd love you to make a little bit of noise this evening if you're on there. And this evening we'll be talking about the future of marketing. So, thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you for coming um, uh, to see me on uh, what I hear is uh, Dublin's best summer evening uh, so far this year. So uh, I'm, I'm amazed you're here. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here for, for three reasons, really. Um, one is to come and talk to you. Uh, it's rare that I get the opportunity to talk to an audience that's so diverse. Normally, we speak to our clients and media owners, but it's great to be able to speak to educators, students, people who just have an interest in marketing. So uh, I'm really interested to hear your point of view about the kind of things I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, I'm secondly very pleased to be here because it's my first time in Dublin, so uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing a bit of the city and I'm also thirdly very pleased to be here because Tim's promised me a pint of Guinness as my fee afterwards, so I should be very much looking forward to that. Um, so I've basically come to talk to you today based on uh, the programme that's been going on throughout, throughout the summer to share a perspective on the, the future of marketing, to give uh, a, a perspective on what we think marketing is going to do, where we think the skills need to come from, and very much it's the skills for a digital world. Uh, I'm very much going to focus on or come from the world of technology and where technology is taking marketing. That's not to say that technology is everything, uh, but it's to say that technology has three primary kind of um, drivers that make it relevant for this kind of uh, presentation. The first is that it's universal, it's touching everything. It's, 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 and, and we'll look into this later on, it's a, a global phenomenon. Um, it's, it's, it's happening in many, many different ways. It's touching every sector. Secondly, it's accelerating so that th those changes are compounding upon each other uh, and, and creating all sorts of different sort of second, third, fourth order effects uh, in all sorts of industries, uh, not just the marketing of those industries, but also uh, the fundamentals of those industries themselves. And, and thirdly, that it, it is, to some sense, uh, predictable. Uh, many of the other things that will impact on the future of marketing over the next five, ten years, we can't predict. There'll be the, the short-term cultural shifts, the, the big new stars, the big news events that we can't possibly predict. But technology gives us a framework in which we can understand where those things are going. So this perspective about the future of marketing very much comes from where we see technology going and how we see technology impacting upon that. And what that's going to generate is the need for a vastly, and Tim touched upon this, a vastly different set of skills, a vastly more diverse set of skills, and a vastly more agile set of skills. Uh, by the way, do um, put your hand up if you want to challenge any of these points or um, uh, ask me to, to explain something a, a bit further. So uh, we'll take questions at the end, but do, do feel free to, to shout and throw bits of rotten fruit at me uh, if, uh, if, uh, if you don't agree with what we're saying. So basically what we're going to look at uh, today is how we think technology is driving that change in the marketing sector in terms of consumer behaviour, uh, in terms of the business opportunities out there. And then once we kind of have got that basis of uh, why we think that marketing is driving that change, what does it mean for marketing? Uh, you know, how can marketing lead in that digital world? Uh, how can it manage complexity? How can it create value from data? And also, how can we leverage brands in this kind of world? Brands have generally been built in a, in a mass marketing, mass communications environment. Brands have a slightly different role in a more digital kind of environment. So a little bit of background, some numbers that you may or may not know. Um, the fact is that when I was doing these presentations 10 years ago, there was still some debate about whether digital was really here to stay. Uh, I did a, uh, a presentation uh, in, in Slovakia, I think in about 2006, and, 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 and said similar things to what I'm going to be saying today, uh, but from the perspective of 10 years ago. Uh, and a guy got up on the stage after me and said, I can promise you, everyone, the internet is just a blip. It'll go away. Um, I don't think anyone can really say that today. Uh, I think we can all accept that the internet and digital technology have had a profound influence on the world that we live in, and I'd like to, to argue that it will continue to have a profound influence in many more interesting ways uh, for at least the foreseeable future. We sit at the point now where 
uh, depending on your, your source of data, we are either side of there being 3 billion people out of the 7 point something billion people alive today who, will be, who are online. Um, you know, just about um, half of that population of, of, of the world. Um, that's going to grow, according to the OECD, to be 7.6 billion people who will have access to some form of internet technology. Now, that may be uh, access to a smartphone in a village in, in Africa. It may not be their particular phone, but they'll be able to access that, that, that kind of technology. Uh, Jimmy Wales believes that the, the fundamental technology of the 2020s is just about to be invented, and that's the $10 smartphone. Once you get a $10 smartphone, that's the price point at which pretty much everyone can access that kind of technology. And once you get everyone accessing that kind of technology, or the vast majority of people accessing those kind of technologies, then, then we can really start to do amazing things. There's amazing things going on in the developing world around the pricing of, of um, commodities. So it used to be the case that things were very inefficient, that uh, you know, in, farmers in India may be, uh, you know, when the onion crop comes in, uh, everyone harvests their onions at the same time. They all go to the same market. That week, there's a glut of onions. They can't sell their on onions for any kind of profit because there's far more supply and demand. 50 miles down the road or you know, 10 kilometers down the road, the next market may have no onions for sale and, and everyone's clamoring to buy those onions. Actually, through SMS, through WhatsApp, through those kind of messaging services, actually, markets can start to, to organize themselves in the way that we've done for many years here, but actually in, in those developing markets, technology is really unlocking uh, many, many different things uh, to, to, to happen that really drive economic growth. And there are literally thousands of stories around the world in which technology is profoundly changing people's lives. Also, there's some big money behind things. Uh, according to Boston Consulting Group, uh, the internet economy in 2013 was worth about $4.2 trillion. Uh, that's out of about a 75, 70 to 75 trillion dollar global economy. So it's already a big chunk. Uh, the UK uh, at that point had the largest um, chunk of, so the, the UK is predicted to have the largest chunk of its GDP uh, by 2016. Back in 2013, it was, it was about 9%. Uh, BCG forecast that just about one, one pound and eight in the UK will be derived from the internet. Uh, next year. So it's a very large part of, part of the economy. Uh, and, you know, markets, the other markets of Western Europe are, are really not very far behind. So these things really are driving an awful lot of growth. And also, uh, when I mentioned that point about acceleration, the fact is that change is accelerating um, at an accelerating rate. Um, and also disruption is accelerating. So this is, my, I think, probably my favourite statistic of the year. Um, and, it, and it's changing. Uh, this is already out of date. Um, but uh, it took the global mobile phone industry, an enormous industry in its own right, um, worth, worth a couple of trillion dollars a year in its own right, about 20 years to build a global messaging system that could deal with about 7.5 trillion SMS messages per year. Uh, you know, many, many thousands of engineers, you know, huge amounts of investment. Um, in about uh, three years, uh, 30 engineers from WhatsApp built a platform that now delivers 11 trillion messages per year. Now, this is a number from about six months ago, so that number is now out of date. I'd be surprised if it's less than 13 or 14 trillion messages per year that WhatsApp is, is generating. So we're really starting to see that um, there's plenty of room for that kind of innovation. Uh, SMSs have not collapsed. They, they, they've gone down a little bit since their peak. But you know, WhatsApp, with just 30 engineers, uh, and 30 engineers and a few other members of staff, uh, sold to Facebook for just shy of $20 billion. Uh, so the, the revenue per, per, per employee there is pretty, pretty tasty. Um, uh, you, know, you really can find that if you've got a global platform and a great idea, you can really change the world in incredibly quickly. And this really means you know, more of everything. Um, it's, a, it's a theme I've been exploring a lot over the last year or so. It just, it just drills back to there is just more of everything. The cost of supply just diminishes in, in a digital world. Uh, the cost of supply, when everyone is connected, uh, you know, really does kind of fall through the floor. Um, Tim mentioned the fact that we exist in a, in a golden age of content. And that's often just because there's a lot more content. There's actually a lot more rubbish content out there, uh, but there's also a lot more really, really good content. Um, I always leave this number up. Um, uh, in 2014, there were... Uh, so in 2009, there were 87 scripted original TV shows on US cable TV. Uh, there are just not actually that many more US cable TV stations, but last year there were 199 original scripted TV series in the, in the US. So just in five years, it's more than, you know, more than doubled in terms of the number of uh, original scripted TV shows 
in, in US TV. And that's the, 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 what some people might call the, the dinosaur of TV. That's, that's old broadcast TV. Uh, what you've also got on top of that is the vast amount of stuff coming out of the likes of Netflix. You've got the fact that uh, YouTube now claim that uh, 300 hours a minute uh, of, of original new content is created uh, on, on, on YouTube. That's the equivalent of 18,000 live TV stations constantly creating new stuff. A fair amount of that stuff may be dogs on skateboards, but virtually all of those things have an audience. It may be a niche, tiny audience, or it may be a mass audience, the, the likes of PewDiePie. Um, if you look at the top two reaching children's TV uh, channels, with a, with a broader defin definition of, of children, children's TV channels, they, the video properties that reach the most children worldwide each month, there are two YouTube channels about Minecraft. Um, you know, Minecraft is, a, is an entire world and a universe on its own uh, that uh, pretty much any boy between the ages, or many girls as well, pretty much any child between the ages of kind of five and 12 are, are crazy about. Uh, two of my sons are, are completely addicted to it. Uh, you know, we are seeing just a lot more content being, being, being generated there. There are also just many, many more channels and techniques out there. So, you know, we've had the original kind of five media channels. They were joined in the late 1990s by this thing we called digital or the internet. Uh, actually, the internet and digital has spawned many, many other channels and techniques. The way we do social advertising, native advertising, search advertising, mobile advertising, connected TV advertising. We'll look at the internet of things. There are many, many more channels and techniques that, 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 that are out there. And finally, also, of course, there's just a lot more data and we'll explore this later on as well. Um, a key point I want to make when it comes to the way we think about media, and it alludes to Tim's point of why we need new skills coming into the business, is that when I started in the business 20 years ago, a decent size, you know, million euro, five million euro uh, advertising campaign essentially could be defined by about a thousand decisions. Um, you know, what channels you're going to go on, where the spots are going to go, what pages the TV ads, the, 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 the print ads might go on. All of these things uh, could be defined by about a thousand decisions. In a programmatic world, where in, 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 with programmatic media, um, you know, each advert you see is tailored to you. Tim will go on to um, Yahoo, uh, Yahoo.ie uh, this evening, and you know, based on his previous behaviours, based on data, data about him, many, many advertisers will, will bid for, for, for us, uh, and, 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 and the ad that we see will be essentially the, the highest bidder. Each individual impression has several dozen decisions behind it. Uh, and very, very soon, that's actually, as these things get more sophisticated, they'll have several thousand decisions behind them. So actually, a media campaign of that same monetary volume will have several trillion decisions behind it, not several hundred. Uh, that's you know, many, many orders of magnitude, more complexity. That's the kind of complexity we can't even hope to manage manually. We can't even hope to manage these things on a, on a human basis. We need machines, we need computers to be able to make those decisions for us, our role is to program those machines and to, to make them our tools so that they can do the things that we want and we can create value out of them. Uh, also, just a little bit of background, the fact is that we're now moving to a world where digital is leading the marketing agenda. Uh, it's a little bit different uh, over here, but in the UK, uh, the UK has for some time been the, the leading digital marketplace in terms of the proportion of spend that goes into digital channels primarily because we're pretty crazy for e-commerce. Uh, we love our credit cards. Uh, there's a lot of people in the UK crowded onto a small island, so the likes of Amazon can build a big distribution centre and reach 30, 40 million people with one distribution centre. And so, you know, we, we've been spending an awful lot of money online, and conversely, advertisers have been trying to, to reach us online. But the story is, is very, very similar across the Western, the Western world. Uh, you know, where, where it may be a number in one market this year, it'll be that number you know, a year to maximum three years further down the line. What you can see here with the numbers from eMarketer is that um, for some time, digital has, always, has been uh, the largest area. Digital, excluding mobile, is actually the fastest declining of, of our channels. That's because we've seen this huge shift over to the, to the mobile channels. And so that um, already this year, uh, digital will be more than 50% of all ad spend. Uh, and actually by 2018, they're forecasting in the UK... Uh, these are e-marketers' forecasts, not, 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 not our forecasts, uh, that mobile will be just about the same value as TV and print combined. Now, 10 years ago, those were the two dominant media channels that, that dominated everything. This upstart that even today is still relatively small, uh, they forecast will be, will, will, be, will be bigger than those guys. Another aspect of this is the fact that um, you know, markets that were quite small a few years ago didn't even exist 
10 years ago are now starting to really gain traction. So the, the chart on, the, uh, on your right-hand side um, is, is, uh, illustrates the fact that you know, US box office revenues have been pretty, pretty stable over the last few years, but app store billings uh, on, on, on iOS apps um, have gone through the roof. So, so um, uh, 2014, they overtook US box office. If you do the numbers now, it's pretty much that overall Android, iOS, um, uh, app store billings will roughly equate to the global cinema industry. So what was a huge beast of, of global culture uh, you know, is now being joined um, by, 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 by apps. Um, yeah, the, the only one that the apps are not as big as is the world of video games, which is, which is quite significantly bigger than that in, in its own right. And consumers also expect a lot of change. Consumers understand this stuff. You understand all this stuff because you're living it. Um, you know, the vast majority of you will, will have broadband at home. You've, you've got a smartphone. Um, you, are, you are living this world and, and, and you're doing your banking online. You're doing all sorts of these different things. So we now expect this, this kind of change to happen. Change has become the, the norm. I think these numbers illustrate it quite nicely because it's something that maybe hasn't shifted, shifted yet. It's beginning to be better understood in the US in terms of the world of pay TV. So the question here is, what are the following types of service do you expect to watch most of your TV, movies and sports content through within the next six years, i.e. the year 2020? Um, you know, and what it is basically is 50% more people in the US think it will be primarily via the internet than via pay TV. And pay TV is an enormous industry in, in the US. It's less so in the UK. It's less mature. We've only had Netflix for, for a couple of years or so. Um, but, but consumers do expect these changes. And, and we as OMD have been doing lots of studies uh, around, the, around the world asking consumers about their beliefs about um, technology. And, and the same message comes through again and again and again. They expect there to be at least more use of these channels. And generally, they expect these things to be, to be, to be more dominant uh, over time. That's not to say that any of the traditional channels will disappear. They'll still be there. They'll still have their, their role, uh, but people will be just adding uh, the, these new options, these new distribution mechanisms uh, over, over time because there's going to be more of everything. That's just kind of one example of a, of a, of a trend that's happening around the world in, in many, many different ways. And that's the fact that uh, you may well have heard of this notion called Moore's Law, uh, which is this idea that... Uh, essentially, the speed of a chip doubles every two years or so. It's been an IT thing, uh, and pretty much every IT presentation uh, touches this. The issue is, is that um, that exponential price-performance ratio doesn't just apply to IT. It applies to any industry that IT touches. And basically, what we're seeing now is that because of the internet and digital connectivity, IT is touching many, many more industries um, through all sorts of, of, of different kind of complex uh, relationships. Uh, if you take transportation, for example, and, and just... Quite a, a flippant example uh, might be the world of drones. So these little things that are, that are spinning around the place, um, they didn't really exist 10 years ago. The, the US military were, were experimenting with, with small drones, and they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in, the, in the early 2000s. Um, uh, about, about five years ago, you started seeing the first consumer drones. They're about $1,000. You have to be a real, you know, uh, you know, a, a millionaire to really kind of, you know, want to, want to buy one of these things, and they weren't that good. These little complicated surveys had just been invented, and um, they were being manufactured in, in, in high-end factories. Uh, they now sell these things for $20. Um, what's gone from being military technology, a couple of years later became high-end, hobbyist kind of stuff, now becomes your, your child's Christmas stocking filler. Um, that's, that's just one aspect of these things. Uh, these drones are able to carry ever more weight, uh, and because of that weight issue, they're now starting to touch various different industries. You would have seen the, um, the, the stuff that Amazon did with the Amazon drone delivery, which was something of a marketing stunt, but there are, there are certain kind of real-world applications for these things. Uh, in China, for example, uh, there's a burgeoning industry of drone delivery of TV, of, sorry, of tea. Um, that's, it's quite common in China that if you have an important um, you know, guest or a, or, or a business contact coming to see you, you want to serve them the best possible tea you can. The best possible tea is completely fresh, and you may not have been to the store that morning. So and the thing now is, if your, if your best client comes around to see you unexpectedly, a quick go on, a, on an app, and then you know, within half an hour, a drone is delivering a, a pot of very expensive uh, tea to, to, to your office, and so that you can entertain in, in, in the best way possible. Uh, the Swiss Postal Service are experimenting with drones for, for delivery to mountain areas. Uh, many, many people in Switzerland live, you know, up a mountain somewhere. It's incredibly expensive to, to reach those people because they're so thinly distributed. If you can distribute letters and small parcels via drones, there's huge cost savings for, for those kinds of industries. So that's another part of the, the future of marketing is, is understanding how 
these kinds of technologies will change the fundamental nature of the product, change the use case of what our products that we're advertising, the products that we're marketing, what, what those things might, might, might be. Uh, another aspect of these things is the world of, of genomics, uh, so, so gene sequencing. Uh, the Human Genome Project started in about 1997, uh, billions, of dollars, billions of dollars, about three years later, they got through 1% of the genome, and they're absolutely panicking about how far they'd, they'd get through this project. Uh, but three years later, they completed it because of these exponential effects of, of IT. Uh, we're now at the stage where you can uh, sequence a decent chunk of your genome uh, with the likes of, of 23andMe for, for $100 or so. Um, I spat into a test tube about three years ago and uh, had to fill out an enormous number of forms to explain to US customers why I was sending some of my spit. Um, uh, and, and then they sent me back my genetic profile uh, and all the things that, I might, um, that, that like to kill me uh, later in life, uh, which makes for strange reading. Um, but you know, th those things are now, are now possible. The cost of sequencing a, a genome, um, you know, a full genome, is, is, is approaching $1,000. Um, in the next few years, a couple of years, it'll be $100. Uh, it is forecast that, uh, it, by quite serious scientific institutions that the cost to uh, sequence a genome just for the major genetic markers, for the, the standard kind of illnesses that, that are genetically related, will, will cost a matter of cents. Uh, by, by the end of the decade, in, early in the 2020s. So what they're forecasting is they're going to put these sequences in your toilet. Uh, so you go for, go for a win in the morning, uh, and actually it'll, it'll tell you there's been a change in your genetic markers, and you might want to pop the doctors to, you know, before you've, months before you show any symptoms, this is going to radically transform healthcare, they predict, over the next kind of few years or so. And then looking at the world of, of energy, uh, that's also being radically transformed that um, uh, you take things like uh, the, the, the Tesla uh, box that's going, going on the side of the wall that's able to uh, store huge amounts of, of energy um, and, and, and you know, feed it back into the grid. Um, there's all sorts of really, really interesting things that are going on in, in the energy space. Uh, the, the efficiency of, of solar power, power, the amount of energy being generated by solar power is doubling roughly every three years or so. It's been from a really, really small base. It's been at that point of it's been 0.1%, 0.2%, 0.4% for the last few years. But we're now at the point where it's you know, 1% or 2%, and it's going to be 4, 6, 8, 16. It's going to grow quite significantly over the next kind of few, few doubling cycles to be something that really does impact uh, on the way that we think about energy. Um, you know, and hopefully, maybe, if we're lucky and, 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 and foresight enough, maybe a, a thing to, something to help us um, stave off some of the challenges of, of, of climate change. So we're starting to see that... Um, Information technology uh, is, is really starting to impact on, on many, many businesses. There are, there are many, many more sectors than this. There are many, many more stories than this. But this is where it's universal. This is where the technology is, is starting to affect uh, pretty much everything that we touch. And that's going to be a, a big driver in the change in marketing. But it's also leading to uh, some fun stuff, some, some things that we're starting to see that have been long predicted, uh, that we've talked about in, in science fiction for, for some, some years. They're now starting to become something real. So virtual reality, something that's... Uh, was pretty cool in, in, the, um, in, the, in the early 1990s. If you watch Lawnmower Man, or um, uh, there's a great Oliver Stone miniseries called Wild Palms. Has anyone seen it, by the way? It's, 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 uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful show. Uh, very, quite, quite dated now. Set in 2008. Uh, they get all sorts of things wrong. They, they think some technologies are way ahead of where we got to. Uh, they, they got mobile phones wrong. Uh, they just, just didn't, didn't foresee that coming. Strangely, they got kitchen design exactly right. The, the, the Shaker Star kitchens, they got, they got, they got bang on. Um, but but you know, that virtual reality, with things like the Oculus Rift, with Project Morpheus from, from Sony, these are consumer products that are, are just about to hit us. Um, some of the last little, 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 little kinks that haven't necessarily been ironed out yet, but you know, we are going to probably see a mass market, new kind of media, a, a kind of media, and if you've not experienced uh, VR technology, um, you know, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. It, it can make you feel a bit sick. It's, it's so um, uh, impactful that, that, that often you know, we, we, we have great difficulty in, in necessarily dealing with it. But, but I think it's interesting to show some of the ideas, some of the things people have started to, to think about, the experiences that we can have out of it. So uh, this is an example from uh, a uh, da, 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 hopefully I'll find it. There we go. Um, a, a, a place in Utah that's being built at the moment, uh, which is a, basically a, a bit of a virtual reality theme park. Um, hopefully you'll get the idea within the, in the first kind of 30 seconds or so um, to just illustrate what kind of thing it's about. So you're basically walk, walking around a completely blank corridor, um, but you're wearing a virtual reality headset, so you think you're in a different environment. You touch a real wall, 
you, you touch the, the, the wall in, in virtual reality. You have various different kind of props out there. It's you know, an incredibly immersive experience. It goes on for a couple more minutes, but uh, and I can share, share the links with you. But you know, it, it, this is kind of sci-fi stuff that is being built at the moment, and, and, and the general plan is that if this is successful in the US, then you'll see one of these things. I would suspect in Dublin by the end of the decade, it, it'll it'll probably be you know a, a failing cinema, maybe um, you know, be converted into one of the, these things, or fa failing bowling alley uh, might be turned into into one of these things, and those get better and better and better. A second area is is actually the development of another thing that's been promised for many years. Uh, consumer robotics and also artificial intelligence. Uh, science fiction writers have been writing about this for 50 years. We're now at the point where we actually have real things that, that people are now buying. Uh, robotics uh, in Japan, for example, especially with elder care, is, is a big booming business. In Japan, they've got a big problem with the fact that there's so many people over 65, the economy can't afford to, to look after them. So we're now starting to see in many nursing homes in Japan, uh, robots that are acting as companion robots to talk to, 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 to older people and also to do things like tracking their, their use of, of um, medication and those kind of things. But there's also, we're starting to see some interesting developments in terms of slightly more kind of fun, ev everyday stuff. Uh, this is a thing that's been, uh, that's been invented and uh, will be launched next year. Uh, we've got one on pre-order, so uh, in about a year's time, I'll be able to tell you if it's any good or not. It's a little thing called a Jibo, which is the first family robot. Now, I'm not necessarily saying this thing's going to be an overnight success. I'm, I'm sure for the first couple of uh, iterations, it'll be something for the, the hobbyist, much like that mobile phone back in, back in 1991 that was $1,200 that only the, you know, the, the, the flashiest um, you know, city types were, were, were buying at the time. This, but this may be something that you know, we, we start to consider in our homes through the 2020s. So that there's all sorts of potential applications. And thinking about how do you market to a, a family that's got one of these robots, will actually the robot become a consumer in its own right? Actually, we'll be marketing to that robot. Um, the, the notion of marketing to machines is, is not actually that far-fetched. Uh, many, many brands already do it. We call it search engine optimization. We design our websites. We, we, do our, we invest in various activities that make our content attractive to a Google algorithm or a Facebook algorithm. So marketing machines is already with us. We may be just starting to market to consumer machines rather than just um, business machines. Uh, the last one I won't dwell too long on because it's so abstract, but it's so fundamentally important. And it's this uh, notion of uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain. Um, uh, you may be familiar with, with, with Bitcoin. It's a cryptocurrency, a currency that exists on, on the internet. Uh, its most famous use case so far has been for drug dealers to be able to uh, sell their wares uh, more, more anonymously. Um, but, but actually, the, the technology upon which the Bitcoin is built is a thing called the blockchain. And the blockchain is a, essentially the way that Bit BitTorrent uh, distributes content. Uh, the blockchain distributes trust. Uh, so it's actually a, a digital technology that allows... Um, contracts to be, to be, to be created uh, and managed without any third party. So generally when we have a financial transaction, uh, we have recourse to, to, to the European Central Bank if you're, if you're doing a euro cash note or to your, your, your bank if you're, if you're sending a check. Uh, with blockchain, you don't need that third party. Um, actually, I won't show the video because we're, we're running low on time, but, but I think what you will start to find with, with the blockchain uh, is things like uh, the, the, the degrees that uh, this, uh, the National College of Ireland will be giving out in the 2020s, they may actually be enshrined in the blockchain. It's a, it's a, it's a way in which you, rather than it being a, a piece of paper that sits on your wall, and you may want to show your employer, actually your qualifications will, will go with you. 
Um, actually, the, your qualifications will, will live on the blockchain, and, and you as a freelancer through the 2020s, all of your experience will be enshrined on the blockchain, and that's actually maybe what defines uh, your value as a, as, as a future employee. Uh, so I think there's be all sorts of, uh, and there's all sorts of fundamental, huge changes to the global legal system, to the global uh, financial system, to the global marketing system that will be that will be facilitated by the rise and the or the development of, of blockchain and blockchain type technologies. Um, if you don't believe me, then the Bank of England are looking at blockchain. Uh, Richard Branson hosted a blockchain event on, on Necker Island uh, back in May. Uh, it's something that's starting just coming out of the world of kind of you know ultra geeks, uh, and, and, and the business community is starting to take it seriously. It's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. It's not something you need to worry about today. But it's something that you may want to keep an eye on it because it, it, it's likely to have some quite fundamental effects over the next few years or so. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's those kind of those, those very much those different kind of science sci-fi type technologies that I think we can expect to see uh, over the next few years. Say so, not tomorrow, but they 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 are they exist. They they've been proven technologies, uh, and and they will develop and grow over the next kind of five ten years or so. So just kind of wrapping up that kind of first section, really, um, I think what we're starting to see is that we know that technology has driven a lot of change uh, to date. I think we're starting to understand that technology is likely to drive a lot of change. In the, in the near and, and more distant future. We've got an idea about how it might drive change in that, in, that, in that near future. I haven't got a clue how it's going to drive that change in the long distance future, but we don't need to worry about that. But essentially, it comes down to three key challenges. How can we manage complexity and changeability? That's going to be a key challenge, a key skill set for a marketer in the near future. How can value be created? How can value be created through data in the near future? And finally, how can brands leverage that kind of connectivity? How can brands have new kinds of meaning in, in that future.